So welcome back everybody. Uh, we're here today to have our third module of the COCOS lectures. Today we will talk largely about multidimensional loops and uh, a lot more about like data structures, more things you can do with views, uh, more information about how views behaves, as well as about atomic operations. Uh, as always, you find a lot of information across you know, the internet. Go to our GitHub uh, organization. That's where you find all the codes. Uh, in the Cocos tutorial repo, you find also a wiki with uh, information for the Cocos lectures. Uh, that's where you find like slides, recording, and question and answers for the lectures. Uh, in particular for the two we already uh, recorded. And this one will be available then uh, shortly after we finish this. Uh, also in the main Cocos core rep repo, you will find the wiki with uh, an API reference. So, you know, if you need to look something up in more detail, uh, go there. And as always, feel free to join our Slack channel uh, for questions on Cocos. Uh, you know, that's the fastest way you can get your questions answered. And, uh, you know, everybody's welcome there. Okay, so uh, we are now in the third module. We'll talk today about data structures and multidimensional loops. And then next week we'll come to hierarchical parallelism before going to things like tasking and streams and SIMD classes. What did we learn so far? Uh, in the first module, we talked a bit about the Cocos ecosystem, you know, that there's more than just a programming model, that there's also the tools and uh, math libraries and stuff like that, which will be, uh, you know, uh, talked about more in detail in uh, later modules of this lecture series. Uh, we talked about the build system, how you build Cocos with CMake and uh, you know, potentially with spec, as well as with GNU make files if you don't have any real dependencies. Uh, we talked about data parallelism, in particular, you know, how you parallelize simple parallel loops with a parallel form. Uh, you, know, you give it a label and a number and then just a, a, you know, a lambda. We also talked about reductions. Uh, how you do, you know, reductions combine contributions from loop iterations. Uh, then in module two, last week, we talked about Cocos View, how it's a multidimensional array with compiled and runtime dimensions, and that it's a reference counted data structure uh, like, uh, you know, shared pointer. And uh, we talked about execution spaces, how it allows you to control where to execute code, uh, and how, you know, the, there's this default execution space, which is being used if you don't provide one. We also talked about memory spaces, uh, in particular that, uh, you know, data as a view store the data in memory spaces, uh, that you can provide them as a template parameter to choose, you know, where a view stores its data. Uh, we talked about deep copy and we'll talk about uh, things like create mirror view in order to uh, get a copy of a, uh, or a copy of a view on the host. Then we talked about layouts and how they are important in order to get uh, performance. We talked about how the layout determines how the indices of a view are mapped to the underlying uh, memory location. It's provided as a te template parameter. And that Cocos actually derives default layouts which depend on uh, the execution space uh, associated with the memory space the view lives in. Uh, and that if you just, you know, parallelize over the leftmost index, you get, uh, you get good performance. Uh, we talked about, you know, the underlying reasons about coalescing and caching. Uh, and hopefully, you know, that's something which stuck because that's really, really important in order uh, to get performance. We also talked about advanced reductions. So we talked about, you know, how parallel reduce just as a default summation. We talked about uh, reducers, you know, what you can do arbitrary operations. Uh, we also talked a bit about, you know, a new capability to do uh, reductions over multiple values at the same time. And, uh, you know, how only reductions into a scalar argument are uh, synchronous. Okay, before we come to Today's module, I'm gonna switch for a moment and uh, we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna go through the exercises for a moment. Let me share my other screen. So there were three exercises associated with the, uh, with the last uh, module. 
as always, I'm in uh, the Cocos Tutorials Exercises directory, which is checked out into uh, you know home Cocos with a capital K, and Cocos itself is uh, also checked out into that uh, directory, and that's how the make files are set up. So the first exercise uh, for the last module of exercise two was about uh, introducing views. Right, so if we grab for capital exercise, it says you know that the goal of this exercise is you define the device views, you know, you replace the data accesses with the correct operators, and uh, and then it should just work. And we'll see that in a second. If I let's find the next exercise thing. So um, a typical way how you do that is you start with like uh, you know, type devs or type aliases for defining what your metrics, uh, for what your view types are. In this case, we want uh, a one dimensional view for vectors and a two dimensional view for matrices. We create these uh, views by providing a label for each of these views, which is used in, for example, profiling and debugging, uh, and then the runtime dimensions. Now, we don't need any more the uh, allocations here because the, the three views above will do allocations on their own. We change the access operator to, you know, how Fortran does it with like parent views operators. In fact, the, for one dimensional views, you could actually leave the uh, bracket angles in, but, um, you know, it's not it's not the default thing and uh, in particular for 2D that doesn't work. So we're gonna replace that. Uh, one thing here is um, make sure that the indexing is correct. For the metrics, right, the first index J goes from zero to N here and that matches what we uh, had as the size up here. Okay, we need to do that then also in the, in the main loop. Just do it for a second. Just the three accesses. Ding, ding. And the only thing left is make sure that we don't delete things which don't exist. Cocos views are reference counted, so when we go out of scope at this brace here before the cocos finalized. We will deallocate the memory. You could also explicitly assign a default constructed view to the existing views, which would also reduce the reference count and deallocate the memory. Okay, let's see if this works. So let's build this first for P. Okay, that built. Let's run red and uh, we're getting about the 225 gigabytes, you know, we've seen in the previous example. Uh, so if we go back to like the zero one solution, which was still using raw pointers. That should get the same. Uh, yeah, and you see that's what's happening. Now, one thing you can do now that we replace the view, uh, the, uh, the raw pointers with views is you can actually build the sky for CUDA. One thing it did here, let's run this. Uh, one thing it did here is, uh, let's, uh, you might wonder, you know, the, the original, the, the initialization loops were run on the host. How does that work with the view? And uh, we'll talk about that, uh, well, we actually talked about that then later, that there is this uh, UVM memory space, and that allows allocations which are accessible from both the host and the device. And we set here an option which makes the default memory space uh, UVM. UVM is always available, but in this case, we made it the default so that by not specifying anything, you would still get that and thus both the loops on the host as well as the kernel can access the data. Uh, what that leads to is that if you, you know, we 
run that just uh, one time. And let's run a little bit bigger problem. Uh, what that leads to is that uh, the, the first iteration of this kernel right, needs to page fold all the data to the GPU and that page fold latency is really high and so you get a uh, very low uh, bandwidth. Right? If you run it uh, then multiple times afterwards, you know, every subsequent run is actually fast and uh, it's just that you know, this first run essentially gets the time a bit down. Okay, then the next exercise, three, uh, was about replacing uh, replacing the uh, UVM allocations uh, or the, the possibility to do get away without UVM allocations in, for GPUs and actually introducing host mirrors so that we have explicit deep copies going on. So how does that work? We start roughly the same way. Uh, you know, you have your views created and then there is this thing, you know, where you create mirror views. And uh, let me actually do that. Uh, just copy that in. So now we have the host versions of the codes, of the, of the allocations. Um, note, I prepended them with h underscore. That's kind of a common, uh, you know, pattern for people to do. Now, what we need to do is we need to access the host versions in the initialization, which just happened in the loop on the host. And after that initialization, we need to perform deep copies. So deep copies are working like mem copies. So you give it uh, the destination first and then the source. Let's do it for all three. And that's it. Now when we compile that, what we now get when we run the same thing, you know, also with the n repeat one, remember we got about four gigabytes a second in the, in the thing with, uh, with UVM allocated. We're getting now 474 here because the data is already on the GPU by the time the kernel launches. Now, obviously, uh, that's a little bit unfair comparison, right? Because we, uh, we didn't measure the deep copy, but at least, you know, you don't get surprised and you don't get the, the uh, mem you know, the, the mem or the deep copy time kind of uh, implicit in the first kernel, right? And might be wondering what the heck is going on. Uh, but this, even besides that, it turns out um, when we uh, try and uh, copy that in, it's actually a bit faster to do it via explicit deep copies than via the implicit deep copies uh, through uh, UVM memory. Let's rebuild that for a second. So what we get here is, uh, you know, not much faster, but a little bit, you know, it's like 4.6 versus, I think we ever one, let's see, uh, was, uh, was like uh, 4.2 or 4.3. I oh, know. Yeah, so it's a little bit slower, right, for the other one. Uh, Actually, the funny thing is that this is, uh, well, this was on the x86, right? On the, on the uh, power systems with NVLink, the difference is actually significantly larger. So you would get, uh, you know, the, the deep copy can actually copy with like 90 gigabytes a second or so, while the page fold always is in the single digits uh, because it's latency limited, not, uh, and not uh, bandwidth limited. Okay, there was a fourth exercise. We look at that guy. Um, in this case, we wanted to show you, you know, that you can uh, that you can explicitly set all these execution spaces and stuff like that. 
So let's start with just choosing, you know, CUDA and CUDA space as the memory space. Now uh, we also need the layouts because it also shows the layout. Let's start with layout left. We type the uh, range policy, you know, with the execution space in there. We add now to the the type depths of our data structures, the layout and the memory space. Everything else stays the same. We're just going to replace here the n uh, so just add the label uh, with the uh, uh, range policy type there from above. And we need to tell it a begin and an end. Okay. So now if we compile this, and by defa default it's compiling for CUDA, you see that it put in the NVCC wrapper here and it built the CUDA objects, but it also enabled OpenMP. You see that in the make file, you see that we all enable both CUDA and OpenMP backends. Uh, now we did the, the CUDA build right? and we get the uh, 500 gigabytes or so from the, uh, what we expect on CUDA. But now we can change this and uh, use the different layout. And that was the importance of the layout, right? Uh, but if we use layout right here, we're going to see a quite significant drop in uh, performance. Right? So we lost like, I don't know, kind of like free access or so. Now, we also can, without changing our build options, uh, use OpenMP because we enabled OpenMP as well. So I'm not changing the build options, it's still building CUDA, it's still building with a CUDA compiler, but it, uh, as I said, it has also OpenMP enabled. And now when I run this guy, I'm getting the performance of the, uh, of the dual socket uh, Skylake here. I can demonstrate that by OMP num frets equals one. If I run that now, I'm getting significantly lower performance because I'm only running with a single thread. Okay. But you noticed I used layout right here. That was the bad performance on the GPU. If I make it the good performance, you know, or what, what was the good performance on the GPU, what's now going to happen is my performance on the CPU will stink. Instead of 200 gigabytes a second, I'm getting 48. Okay. Okay. So um, that was it for the exercises. Let me switch back. Any questions on that I need to answer? No. Can you make sure you're in full screen? This is not in full screen. Do slideshow. No, a slideshow will automatically go forward. Don't want the sidebar. You want just the sidebar go away, right? Yeah. No. Uh, doesn't let me do that. If you go in slideshow, Christian, you can usually pause it and do it manually afterwards. Just a second, I'm just going out. You notes. Notes. 
Close. No, that wasn't it. Ah. One second. Little technical problems. Uh, the slideshow, uh, how? Oh, the the slideshow, you can pause it. Oh. And then it's going to be manual. Okay. Let's try this. Share screen. Go back. Dip. Okay. So today we're going to talk about, uh, in module three, about multidimensional loops. So we're going to talk about how to parallelize tightly nested loops. Then we're going to talk about subviews and unmanaged views, in particular, you know, how you get uh, slices of views. We'll talk a bit about view assignment rules and we'll talk about how to interoperate with external memory. Uh, when we're going to talk about atomic data access, both with using atomic functions, as well as how to implement optimal scatter contribute patterns with what we call a scatter view. And then we're going to talk at the end about dual view, which is a, a kind of utility class which helps you manage data synchronization in cases where you do not really have a holistic view of the data flow necessary in your application. So, Apparently, spacebar doesn't know. Um, let's talk about tightly nested loops. So, what we want to learn here is, uh, you know, how to use MD range policy for tightly nested loops. You know, why you would want to do that. Uh, we'll talk about the syntax of that thing. We'll talk a bit about performance considerations and some code examples. What? This doesn't work. If you want to try again what you had before, Christian, some of the users are saying that you can hide, uh, there's a button to hide it. This doesn't work at all. Should be a hide sidebar. I do. Oh. Hide sidebar? Yay. Good. Thank you, guys. Very good, now it works. Um, okay, so why do we want the MD range policy? So the main reason for it is that, you know, often in codes we have these kind of nested for loops, right? You have like three tightly nested loops and or two or four or whatever. Uh, and when you call some function, you do some operations inside the loop body. And if you, you know, just know what we taught you so far in module one and two, you would say, okay, you know what, I can just parallelize that outer loop. You know, I can put there in a parallel four around that, I'll loop over the N0 things, and then I have two nested loops inside of my uh, parallelized loop. The problem is that only parallelizes along that one dimension, and so it leaves, you know, uh, parallelism unexploited. In particular, think about a situation, you know, where uh, N0, N1, and N2 are 100. Uh, while on the CPU, that might be fine. On a GPU, you know, just parallelizing over 100, as we learned uh, last time, is not good enough, right? You need, uh, on a modern GPU, you know, 100,000 bay parallelism in order to get, uh, you know, really anywhere. Uh, while the N0 itself doesn't give you that, you know, the product of the three does. Now, you could, in principle, you know, just collapse the loops and then do your own index calculation internally. But, uh, you know, that's not what is really recommended. In particular, OpenMP actually has a solution for that. And what that solution is, is the collapse clause, right? So you can write pragma OMP parallel four and then have that on top of like a number of loops and then add a collapse clause and that will tell it, oh, actually parallelize the, the whole uh, cross product of that index space. And, uh, you know, that works actually reasonably well. And what this does is, it essentially changes the execution policy, uh, you know, by adding that collapse clause. And that's exactly what you do in Cocos 2. You change the policy. 
Instead of just having a range policy, you now have an MD range policy for multidimensional range policy. So MD range policies can parallelize tightly nested loops of uh, actually two to six dimensions. You can, uh, what you do there is you uh, specify the dimensionality of a loop as uh, uh, through a template parameter to the MD range policy. That is this rank thing there. So rank three means, you know, you get uh, three dimension. Uh, then you provide the, uh, you provide initializer lists for the begin and end values, right? So this guy would iterate from 0, 0, 0 to n0, n1, n2. Uh, one important thing here is considering how this is set up, right? Uh, you can only have rectangular iteration spaces. So it's similar to views, right? Where you can't have like a, a red, ragged index space. Uh, and then last but not least, the lambda or functor operator now takes uh, multiple indices, one for every uh, dimension. And so you get the i, j, k here. MD range policy doesn't really change anything, you know, for, uh, uh, it's just a policy, right? So you can actually do parallel reduce with this thing. And it doesn't really change the rules for parallel use either, right? So you still get an additional thread local argument to your operator. You see that here, you know, with double L sum. You can do other reductions by providing reducers instead of uh, uh, just a result argument. You can give views as a reduction argument. The only thing which doesn't work yet is the multiple reducers that uh, we haven't implemented yet. Now, one thing people, you know, who are familiar with tightly nested loops often wonder uh, is that uh, in like structured grid applications and stuff, you know, you often apply a tiling strategy. Essentially, that is something where you, uh, instead of just, you know, uh, looping through one row completely, right? You just loop over kind of like sub uh, boxes and then go to the next sub box. And that can help with things like caching. And in fact, MD range policy does that. It has a built in tiling strategy uh, for the iteration space. You can specify that explicitly as a third initializer list. Uh, if you don't, we try to come up with a heuristic. Generally, our heuristic isn't great. Uh, essentially, it turns out that the tiling strategy is too problem dependent to really get uh, invent a good heuristic. Uh, so playing with that can help a lot with performance. In a future Cocos release, uh, we have that kind of already working in prototype, but it's not released yet. But in the future Cocos release, this will uh, also have the option that you can just auto tune the tile sizes. Uh, one word of warning, the way tiling right now is implemented, uh, the tile sizes have to fit into a CUDA block if you compile for GPUs or a HIP block when you compile for, uh, for a HIP, right? Um, and that means the product of the tiling dimensions needs to be you know, small enough that it can fit into a single thread block with one thread doing one index set, right? So uh, that means, you know, in general, it can't be larger than 1024, and sometimes it needs to be smaller than that, depending on how many registers you're using. So if we now think about initializing a matrix, right? So we had this 2D matrix, and, uh, you know, we could now initialize that with an MD range policy instead of uh, using nested loops. But there's a problem. What about the layout? What about the access pattern, right? I could have a matrix with layout left. I could have a matrix with layout right. How does that make sure that I get the right access pattern, right? How do I know that with the MD range policy that I get the right access pattern? And the point is that an MD range policy actually has uh, its own patterns. Uh, it has its own iteration patterns. And these are optional arguments to the rank argument. And it actually takes two. The reason that it takes two is that 
you have both an iteration pattern, how you iterate over the different tiles, and then an iteration pattern, how you iterate within a tile. Okay. Uh, and that's the two things you provide. So then uh, what you would do is, uh, you know, you would just match that to whatever the layout is. So if you do iterate left, you know, then that matches the layout left. If you do iterate right, it matches the, uh, the layout right. And thus you get, uh, you know, good access patterns. The defaults for these parameters uh, actually end up matching default memory layouts. So if you compile for CUDA and you just leave it all out, right? You leave the layouts out here, you leave the iterate stuff out here, you get left and left. If you compile for CPUs, you know, you leave the uh, thing out here and here, uh, you get layout right. There's an exercise associated with this. Uh, in this exercise, uh, it essentially begins with the solution of what was the second exercise. And uh, what you do now is you initialize the, uh, the views X and Y directly on the device using Paraform range policy. And then for, the, for A, you're supposed to replace the, uh, the 2D loop with just an MD range policy. Uh, you know, loop. One side note, there's a couple more template parameters which are actually common to all policies. So that's true for range policy, for, uh, for the MD range policy, as well as the team policy we're gonna introduce next week. Uh, one of these parameters we already knew about, that's execution space, which controls where the code will execute when you dispatch with that execution policy. But there's others. One of them is schedule. So uh, the schedule essentially sets an internal scheduling, scheduling policy. Uh, you can choose where between static and dynamic. Uh, that is directly equivalent to uh, the, the OpenMP kind of scheduling uh, choices. Uh, and and what that does is that if you turn on dynamic, right, in particular on CPUs, uh, you get, uh, you know, the, you get essentially work stealing going on between the threads. That does in particular help if you have load imbalanced uh, work. You know, so if, if some iterations take significantly longer than other iterations because they, you know, hit different branches of the code or whatever, uh, then dynamic scheduling can help significantly. Uh, Dynamic scheduling costs a little bit, right? Because uh, this work stealing mechanism is, you know, a little bit exp more expensive than just doing a diff mod operation to figure out what uh, what the threads ranges. Uh, but it's fairly optimal. Uh, so it used to be that our dynamic scheduling, for example, was orders of magnitude faster than uh, than Intel's OpenMP scheduling, uh, because uh, what we do is true work stealing. So every thread gets its own range and then it steals from somebody else's range uh, as opposed to a work sharing where there's just a central counter to give out work. So, you know, dynamic scheduling is generally pretty fast. Dynamic scheduling doesn't really do anything on GPUs because uh, GPUs internally already do dynamic scheduling, right? They have a schedule, work scheduler anyway in the GPU and the hardware and that does effectively the job of dynamic scheduling anyway. Another option is the index type that controls what the internal indexing type is, as what the integer type is. We use internally for like index calculations and stuff like that inside the policy and also inside the Perl for loop, you know, and to divide like the ranges and stuff like that. Uh, it sometimes can help when you know that you never iterate over more than two billion in a loop, right? Uh, to explicitly use a 32-bit integer instead of, you know, the 64-bit integers, which are largely the default internally for Cocos. Uh, it helps you with things like vectorization because your integer vector length gets twice as long. The last one is kind of interesting. It's a work tech. Uh, essentially, you can give an arbitrary class to, uh, the policy. And what then happens is that in the Perl 4 or Perl reduce, uh, instead of calling the operator, which just takes an integer, it will call an operator, which as its first argument takes the same class. What that allows you to do is it allows you to do have to implement a, uh, a class, which has multiple operators in it. 
effectively a functor with multiple operators in it. Now, it isn't super useful if you write your functors anyway from scratch, right? But if you start with a big class-based application, right, where, uh, where your class structures, you know, your object-oriented programming is kind of functionality-based, often these classes have multiple loops you have to do. And in that case, you know, uh, taking this approach helps quite a bit because what you do is you just take every loop, you know, and stick it in its own operator, have for every one of these guys a tag, and then you call in the place where you had the normal for loop, you know, before uh, now the parallel for with that tag. Uh, this is by way how LAMPS is implemented. So with that, we come to the summary of MD range policy. Uh, essentially what it does, it allows for tightly nested loops similar to the OpenMP collapse clause. It requires functors and lambdas with as many parameters as its rank is, and it works with parallel four and parallel reduce. Uh, we have a tiling strategy, and uh, you can control how this iterates by uh, using compile time uh, parameters. Any questions? Okay, when we'll go on. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is subviews, how you take slices of views. So we'll talk a bit about, you know, what a subview is, why you would need that, uh, what the capabilities is, are. We'll talk a bit about, you know, when you should use that. And we're also gonna talk about uh, view assignment rules. It's a little bit in, uh, an advanced uh, topic and you know most of the time you don't need to really worry about it but I think it's good to have that on the record. So sometimes when you have code right you want to call functions which only operate on like a subset of data. One of these examples is for example you want to call something like a Frobenius norm on a matrix slice of a rank free tensor right so you have a you have some function you know which gets this rank free tensor and then you want to call uh, something on a specific submetrix of that uh, rank free tensor, right? And the question is, how do you get that object, right? How, what do I need to pass on here? And if you think about Fortran and MATLAB or Python, right, you can actually do that. There is this kind of slice syntax where you tell it, oh, I want the, the i-th matrix, you know, and the columns here say, take all the indices, you know, in that direction. And Cocos can do that too, because, you know, we are not too proud to learn from Fortran or Python or MATLAB. So we do that via something we call a subview. There's a Cocos subview function, which can be used to get a view of a, to a subset of an existing view. So what is a subview? It is a slice of an existing view. Uh, and if you call that function subview, it takes a view and it, ta it takes then slice arguments for each dimension and uh, it then returns a view of you know, that appropriate shape according to these slice arguments. The important thing is the subview and the original view point to the same data. There's no memory allocation going on. There's no copying going on. If you modify an element through the subview, you see that modification, you know, if you access it through the original view, the same element. If you modify it through the original view, you see that in the subview. It just points to the same data. You can construct these guys in the host or on the host or within a kernel. That is different to the normal view construction, you know, where we, where we had the allocating constructor. Uh, because we can't do allocations inside, inside GPU kernels, you know, you can't do that but you can do it with uh, subviews because we are not allocating anything, right? We are just pointing to the same already existing data. And basically we have similar capabilities as you get in MATLAB and Fortran, you know, you have things like the equivalent to the column notation, et cetera. So let's look at a small example for that. So, and we start again with, you know, this kind of three dimensional view. And if you want, a two-dimensional slice, you know, at index i0 in the first dimension. In MATLAB or Fortran, you know, as we said before, what you do is you provide that i0 and then you provide the columns for the other access parameters. In Cocos, you do that via the subview function, but it looks reasonably similar. Uh, you give the, you give the 
view you know you want to take a sub view from as a first argument and then you provide an index for you know what what the matrices you want and then instead of a column you provide cocos all uh, yeah making an operator which takes column as an argument doesn't really work in the c++ language so we couldn't quite match the same syntax uh, you also can as for example in python give ranges right you can uh, give a pair here and uh, then you get uh, just the range you know from 0 to n1 you can also do something like 5 to n1 minus 5 right if you want a uh, kind of an inner subset or something like that uh, and that's essentially shows you what the three uh, argument types are for the slice arguments so you can have an index and for every index i you know the rank of the resulting view is decreased by one right so if you you can actually get a sub view of a single element right by just giving indices and then the uh, resulting sub view will be of rank zero if you give an index it must be you know it can go from zero all the way to extent or one smaller than extent you can give uh, cocos pairs uh, and you also can give std pairs uh, just that std pair doesn't always work in the GPU code because it doesn't work with like necessarily all the compilers inside of GPU code. So we have Cocos pair which works the same way as std pair uh, and you know that's why I mentioned it here. The pair you give is essentially a half open range right so it includes the, the resulting view will include the, the first argument but it will uh, only include you know the last argument minus one you know it's an open range like typical also what you do with like iterators when you give iterators to like standard algorithms and the begin and end must be within you know the extents of original view and begin and end should be uh actually no i think if, they, if begin is larger than end uh it will no it will fail yeah so you know begin should be smaller than end and begin needs to be larger equal zero and smaller than extent but you can give begin and end the same value if you give them the same value you essentially get a cocos view with extent zero right a, what we call a degenerated view but you can do that which turns out to be actually useful in certain situations uh, and then the last thing is cocos all that references the entire extent in that dimension it's essentially equivalent to providing, you know, make pair zero to the extent of that view in that dimension. And it's equivalent to what colon is in like Fortran and Python and stuff like that. Generally, you should use auto to figure out what the return type is of a subview. If you really are in a situation where you can't, uh, you know, you have to do something else. You have to use like, for example, decal type on the subview function to figure out, you know, what that type is. Uh, generally, the problem is that a subview returns an implementation defined uh, type, right? It, it's still a normal view, right? But it's actually kind of hard to figure out what are the layouts, you know, and what is the, what is the, uh, what is the dimensions and stuff like that. As whether they are like compile time or runtime. As said, you can create Cocos pair for partial ranges in the kernel. And one thing, you know, constructing subviews in inner loop can have performance implications. You shouldn't wor worry too much about it. One thing is it's probably going to get better in the future because compilers get better and also the implementation of like uh, what we're going to replace our implementation with MD span is better than what we have right now. Uh, generally, the cost of this is only roughly, you know, doing the index calculation of the original view like a couple times, right? What it needs to do is it needs to figure out what are my offsets, you know, where is a, the compute the offset pointer and it needs to do a couple of like uh, bounce checks and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, that ends up being, you know, 10, 20 ops operations, you know, instructions. So it's not really costly, but it, it is noticeable sometimes when you, for example, just take a, a sub view of like three elements and then you access every one of these elements once right uh, generally prioritize readability and maintainability first you know and only only try to avoid sub views if you see a performance impact where's an exercise for this 
it's again the same kind of the same problem and basically what you're supposed to do in this exercise is you instead of uh, calculating the the dot product you know in the innermost loop via uh, accessing two dimensionally into a you get before that loop a sub view into a for of just the row and then you can uh, you know you compute that dot product by just between uh, two vectors effectively okay any questions on that If not, let me go on to view assignment. So I just said, you know, that subview, it's kind of hard to figure out what the returning type is. You can't just type, you know, any two dimensional type there. And largely that comes from uh, our view assignment rules. If you actually deeply think about what's going on, right, about layouts, uh, memory spaces, and stuff like that, basically our view assignment as well as the copy constructor just does the right thing, right? The things you expect to work kind of work and the things which can't work because the types can't represent each other, you know, we can't represent the same thing, uh, won't work. So what you can do, for example, is you can convert from compile time dimensions to runtime dimensions. That will always work, right? Because I can just make that runtime dimension a five. The other direction also can work, but note I have a five for the runtime dimension here. And that is checked at runtime. If you try to assign from one view with compile time dimensions to another view with compile time dimensions and the compile time dimensions don't match, that will give you a compilation error. If you try to assign from a runtime dimension to a compile time dimension and the runtime dimension doesn't match, it will give you a runtime error. If you try to assign from a host space to a CUDA space, that will give you a compilation error. If you assign layouts, you know, non-matching, that will give you a compilation error. Uh, you can do the non-const to const conversion, right? That works. You can't do the const to con uh, non-const, that will give you a compilation error. Same as, you know, you can't assign a const int pointer to an int pointer. Uh, you always can assign from layout left to layout stride. So stride as layout stride has just arbitrary strides in each dimension. That means that the view of layout stride actually doesn't need to be contiguous, right? So not every element in the memory span is uh, part of a view. But that works always. Layout left and layout right are just special cases of a general layout stride. Right. Uh, the other way around, layout stride to layout left, that only works if the strides are actually uh, correct, right? If the strides actually match what layout left is. So, and that's what brings us to subview. Say you get the subview here, right? Obviously, this guy, this first try here, doesn't work. The reason that it doesn't work is because you're actually only getting a 2D view out of this, right? You have two all arguments and one index. That means the resulting subview is a, a rank two view. And so that assignment can't fail, uh, can't work. Now, this assignment, right? That's the main reason why we said use auto. In principle, you could think, oh, I'm getting a 1D view back, right? I'm getting a vector back, so why can't I assign, can't I assign that? The thing is, it actually works if you compile for the GPU, because then this guy will be layout left and V will be layout left. And that means the leftmost uh, dimension is the stride one dimension. And so I can do the assignment. But if you compile for layout right, that leftmost dimension is not stride one. The rightmost dimension is stride one. And this guy actually has a stride of N1 times N2. And so the assignment will fail. And it will actually fail at compile time. Uh, you know, things like that will give you a runtime error. Basically, what this guy will return is it will return uh, it will return. Uh, actually, this one probably also gives you a runtime error. Uh, 
uh, basically what this returns is it returns the layout stride and when it figures out, oh, you know, the way the strides are, that doesn't represent a layout left or layout right, uh, you, so I'll give you a runtime error. This one will work because any, any valid sub view of a layout left or layout right view is always layout, uh, is, can be represented through layout stride. But, you know, all of this is complicated. So get subviews with auto, please. And, you know, for all the other things, you actually get uh, pretty far by never, you know, do, thinking about these assignment rules too much. You know, a lot, of, a lot of functions can be written as like unconstrained templates, for example. Okay, let's come to a summary. So, you can use subviews, you know, to get uh, a view into a portion of a view. Uh, it helps in particular with things like code reuse, right? Because now you can uh, call into functions, you know, which uh, are only written for lower rank views. Uh, it helps you with code readability and it helps you with library function compatibility, right? Like for example, uh, if you want to call Cocos kernels and the map libraries in there and you want to call a dot product, you know, that dot product only exists for rank one views, right? And so, you can't give it uh, two matrices and an index to indicate which rows you want to use. Uh, it works similar to what you can do in Python, MATLAB, and Fortran, right? You can get a subview and you can give indices, you can give uh, all as we could into a column, and you can give pairs. As I said, the return type of subview is complicated, use auto. And one other thing we saw here is the view operator, you know, and basically it just does the right thing. You know, don't really worry about it at first. Uh, this is more advanced stuff and it's more things you have to worry about, you know, when you uh, like, for example, assign classes to each other, right? Which, uh, with, which with members of views. In those cases, you have to bit, uh, think a bit about that. But, uh, you know, come back to these slides when you actually run into trouble. Okay, do we have any questions on that? I should answer here. We, we had a question whether you could have, uh, uh, you could select a, a subview with only even um, entries in a view. With only what? Only even entries, for instance, in a view. And the answer is no, we don't have. No. Right, it's less. Yeah, we do not have that. That's it. Yeah. The actual problem with that is that, uh, uh, in general, that is not representable with layouts, right? I mean, it is for 1D things potentially, but it is not in, in general representable, in particular, if you only want to range, you know, and every second value in the range. Okay, um, with that, we come to unmanaged views. Uh, this is largely about dealing with external memory, you know, so we'll talk a bit about, you know, why you need unmanaged views. We'll talk about how you create them, you know, what the, how it works and when you should use them. So the fundamental problem is, you know, that uh, sometimes your Cocos code can't really control all allocations. And, you know, as a Cocos person, I would tell you, you know, you better avoid that situation, you know, that leads to all kinds of unpleasantness. But uh, while that is half a joke, you know, um, there is actual real reasons why that can be problematic, right? For example, you don't get necessarily the first touch. It also means that things like our profiling tools don't know anything about the allocations, right? And you, uh, when you use all our tools, you know, later, which we will introduce later, uh, you don't get a total view of, you know, what's going on in your application and stuff like that. So, you know, if you can, let Cocos allocate all the memory. But, you know, there are real reasons why there are situations where you don't want to do that. One of them is, for example, things like uh, uh, IO functionality. You know, often IO functionality is actually surprisingly complex and there isn't really a reason to convert them to use Cocos, right? Uh, usually they are not in the performance critical path for you. And if they are in the performance critical path, the performance criticalness comes from 
the slowness of uh, I/O, not from you know, and maybe you know, reading from a distributed file system and stuff like that, and not from a lack of parallelizing the operations and the thread parallelism. Uh, so that means often you know you really don't want to touch these guys, you know, you just want to leave them alone. Uh, but now you need to interoperate with them, you know. So how do you get, for example, this? data from this matrix reader, you know, which internally reads the matrix into stores its values into a, a standard vector and stores the dimension after reading it from a file, right? How can you get that thing to the GPU without doing extra allocations on the CPU? And that's what unmanaged views are for. Unmanaged views can wrap existing allocations, okay? So, Normally, what happens is that views allocate memory and they manage it. What does manage mean, right? It, it means they, what we mean with that is they reference count it. Instead, what you can do is you can have views which use externally controlled memory. But when you do that, you do not get reference counting. Because we didn't allocate it, we also don't have the right to deallocate it, which means we do not do reference counting. It's kind of more like, you know, uh, uh, normal pointers, right, as opposed to shared pointers. Whoever allocated the memory externally, right, is also going to be responsible for deallocating it again. And so there's no reference counting, there's no deallocation of the structure happening, uh, and so on. Also, there's no check for the correct memory space, and I'm going to repeat that later again, right? You shouldn't try and wrap a standard vector data pointer in a view which pretends to live in cooler space. That can lead to all kinds of nastiness. Okay. But the reference counting is the reason why this is called unmanaged, right? We are not, this view is not managing the underlying allocation. I already mentioned, you know, the, uh, the usage where you want to just wrap, you know, existing allocations coming from some other kind of library or some other functionality. There's also a usage where you do layout punning with this. Um, essentially, what you can do is you can, for example, treat a multidimensional view as a one-dimensional view uh, without copying. Uh, one big place where you do that is you can uh, use that with uh, scratch allocations, right? When you need like temporary allocations for a moment or temporary views, but you do not want to create you know extra memory all over the place, you can actually just you know, view some scratch allocation from somewhere else. Let's go back to our I.O. example first. So we have that class, right, that tests this vector and it, uh, the dimensions. To create now that unmanaged view, what we do is we provide a pointer as the first constructor argument. Then you give all the runtime dimensions, so that works the same as normal view construction. If you have all compile time dimensions, you don't give any other argument than the pointer. And you really, really need to make sure that the layout and the memory space match, right? Uh, and the unmanaged views do not get a label. They do not have a label, okay? So uh, here's the example, right? You have that matrix reader, you read something from a file, and now you give it the values data, the n and the m. Because it was a standard vector, I mean, with a host space, and I assume that the matrix reader reads it out as, uh, as uh, row major stored. If you mess up the memory space, right? For example, functions like, uh, like deep copy, you know, which look at the memory space to figure out how to execute the deep copy, uh, will fail because they try to exit it you know, uh, on, in, from the wrong execution space or with the wrong mem copy argument. If you give me the wrong layout, right? Then say you give me layout left instead of layout right, then effectively it's as if you transpose the matrix, right? Because the ij argument will be, you know, what was previously the ji argument as a element underneath it. You know, functionality like uh, math libraries, like Cocos kernels, it looks at the memory spaces to figure out where to execute the kernel, right? If you lie about it, it will try to execute and will segmentation fault because the, the view is not dereferenceable. So be careful, don't lie about memory spaces and layouts. Uh, 
But how do we get this now on the device? In module two, we learned about the mirror pattern. And uh, that was kind of useful. But the problem was that the mirror pattern started with a device view, right? You started with a view on the device and then you created the host view. Now, what mirror view can do or create mirror view can do is it can also take a space argument. Essentially, you can choose where to create a mirror instead of just creating it on the host. So what you do is you figure out, you know, what the memory space is where you want that thing. And then you call create mirror view and you give it that as an additional argument. And so you can start with that host thing, you know, and then you can create the device view and then you can deep copy between them. Turns out that this create a mirror and then copy pattern is pretty common. Uh, it's so common that somebody felt that we need to write a shortcut for that. And that's create mirror view and copy. And so uh, it does both of these operations at once. This doesn't just work with a host view here, right? That works always. You can, you can also create like a, uh, you know, mirror or something in, in same space or whatever. Uh, the same rules apply for if you give you an argument, right? If the original view is accessible from the execution space associated with that space argument you gave here, it will just return the same guy. Another use case is this, uh, you know, pre-allocating some scratch memory and then uh, viewing it as different types of views, you know, in different places of your code. Uh, what it can do for you, it can eliminate, you know, costly allocations and deallocations of like uh, temporary objects. And it can potentially reduce your total memory footprint if it means that you do not st store persistently objects which, uh, whose lifetime could be smaller, right? Uh, so unmanaged views can be used to get arrays of different shapes backed by the same memory. And that's useful for these scratch allocations. So how does that work? You allocate, scratch memory, you know, with Cocos malloc, uh, or, you know, you can also just create a 1D view of stuff. And when you get, get that pointer out of there and you give it as an argument, you know, to the, to the unmanaged views, uh, and you can create a double pointer, you know, a double, you know, two-dimensional view, you can do an uh, integer view of that. Uh, you can have created them both at the same time. What you obviously shouldn't do is you shouldn't try to access them both at the same time that is potentially bad. Uh, one other word of warning here, you should make sure that the pointer you give uh, fulfills the alignment requirements of whatever the scalar type is you have, right? If you give me a four byte aligned pointer here, uh, that could lead to trouble. Now, one question which then comes up is, how much memory do you actually need to allocate in order to create that view? And uh, the view class has a static member function which uh, tells you that. So there's this required allocation size member function. And what that does is it just takes all the runtime dimension arguments and returns in bytes uh, how much memory you're gonna need. Okay, if you were to give a pointer to, of, you know, a pointer to, uh, to create an unmanaged view. So in summary, unmanaged views can wrap existing allocations. They do not do reference count. Uh, there's no deallocation happening after losing scope. That's why they are unmanaged. They do not manage the underlying allocation. There's no explicit memory space check. If you screw that up, you screw that up. Uh, this is, you know, uh, kind of at your own risk. You create an unmanaged view by providing a pointer and the runtime dimensions, you know, something like this. Uh, and unmanaged views can be used, you know, uh, in particular to get a view into like externally controlled memory. When another use case is this uh, kind of, you know, using scratch memory and uh, seeing it as different types of views in different places of your code, as well as layout pruning, you know, the, when you want to uh, see the underlying data using a different layout. Uh, there's actually people who want to sometimes do that. Uh, it is, uh, you know, it is possible this way, but, you know, you really better know what you're doing, right? 
Okay, that was it for unmanaged views. Do we have any questions on that I should answer here? No. In that case, we are coming to a new topic, threat safety and atomic operations. And uh, what we want to do here is we want to learn about, you know, uh, how you coordinate, you know, or how you collaborate on data with, uh, uh, you know, threading. Uh, we talk a bit about, you know, how certain strategies you use on CPUs like blocks are uh, not scalable and you should avoid them. And they are sometimes even not implementable on certain architectures. Uh, We'll talk about how atomics can paralyze the scanner ad pattern. We're also going to talk about how uh, we can give you a little bit better thing than uh, you know just raw atomics to do scatter scatter contribute patterns. And we'll try and give you a little bit of a performance intuition for you know how costly are atomics. You know uh, what? Uh, how does that depend on you know the the contention rates and the data types and stuff like that? Okay. So one operation which is kind of interesting is creating histogram. So we're looking at that, you know, you have this loop, you compute somehow maybe more or less complex, you know, uh, an index and then you increment uh, the histogram for that index position. Now you might think, oh, this looks kind of like a reduction, but it isn't really. Uh, while there are multiple threads which try to write to the same location, you know, uh, this is uh, the point is that we are not trying all to write to the same location, right? Not every iteration actually contributes to one combined value. Right? It is more a many-to-many -many problem than a many-to-one problem. And so that's why it's not really a parallel reduction, okay? There are a couple of strategies, you know, people deploy for situations like that. Uh, you use locks on CPUs. If compute bucket index is really expensive, right? Then getting a lock here, doing the increment and then unlocking the histogram actually does work if you do not have too many threads. But if you have 160,000 threads running on a GPU, right? Just as a lower estimate, this guy here needs to be 160,000 times more expensive than incrementing that memory location there, right? For it not to stall all the time. So locks are really not feasible on GPUs. There's other problems with locks. It actually turns out that implementing locks without deadlocking is kind of difficult because GPUs do not have the strong forward progress guarantee you have on CPUs. So generally locks are not a mechanism you ever should try to implement. And it actually turns out that in Coco's code, you cannot legally write locks, okay? If you write your own locking mechanism or something like that, or even you're just your own synchronization mechanism, you are violating our semantics. It might work, right? Because the underlying programming model might allow you to do that. But Coco's as a programming model doesn't allow you to do that. Um, Another option is thread private copies. So one way people can do this on CPUs is with, you know, you run with eight threads and you just create eight histogram arrays. Every thread does their own computation, you know, for its own range. And then at the end of it, uh, you just combine them all. And that actually works really well on, on low count CPUs, but the problem is it falls over when you hit, you know, 16 threads or 32 threads or something like that. Then essentially all these arrays, uh, will start to pollute your cache and you have less other data in your cache and your performance drops significantly. So the last option here is you use atomics and that's what we're gonna talk about because it's actually a portable and uh, thread scalable solution. So how does that work? You have that parallel four and then what you do is instead of calling just plus plus, you know, you call an atomic add. What does it take, this function? It takes an address. What is the address, you know, I want to increment? And then it takes the, uh, how much you want to increment it. Uh, there's actually an atomic increment where you wouldn't give the one, 
uh, which on some platforms is a little bit faster when uh, doing atomic add with one. So generally, they are the only scalable solution to threat safety, these atomics, uh, because locks are not portable and the data replication is not threat scalable, right? You can't replicate the histogram array 160,000 times. You will run out of memory. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with atomics, what an atomic is, is essentially what it does is it does uh, what otherwise would be like a sequence of instructions as one uninterruptible instruction. When we talked in the first module about reductions, right, we talked about race condition and how, you know, the operation plus equal to, in, to a value in memory actually is three things. It's a load, then an increment in registers, and then a store. What atomic add does, it does with load, increment, store, as effectively one instruction, which is uninterruptible by anybody else. Okay. So how expensive are these atomics? Basically, we can do a little bit of a thought experiment, right? Say we go with uh, scalar integration, right? What would happen, you know, if we were to run the sky with an atomic instead, right? Everybody contributes to exactly the same place. How much of a performance penalty is actually incurred in this case? And basically, it depends on two values. It depends on how much work you do, how expensive is this function actually, you know, how much instructions are happening in there, and how much coordination happens. So how many people are going to conflict at the same time? We have a slightly better experiment we can do. And essentially what we do in that experiment is instead of into, you know, adding something to a single value, we're adding something into an array. But what we do is we control on how many of these values we uh, do something. So if, if we take this atomic stripe, right, and we make that one, then the index, the resulting index we go into global sum will always be zero. That means you do scalar integration. Every single iteration will contribute to the exact same value. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when you make it really large, like if you make it n, then for every index in global sum, right, there's only one iteration contributing to it. So all the work is independent. Okay. This is what you get when you run that on a, on a, a phi, a KNL, which is like a Trinity of Theta, uh, or actually uh, Curry, um, on a Haswell dual socket, or on a, and I think this was a Pascal P100 GPU for different data types. And what we did here is we essentially ran that experiment with, uh, with 1 million iterations and no additional work. So the only thing happening in each iteration is uh, one atomic add. The contention down here says essentially how, how wide the, uh, how much uh, conflict you have. So for zero, it means that uh, nobody conflicts. So our stride was a million. For six, it means that my stride was one and my contention was one million wide, right? So I have one million potential conflicts. And here you see the speed up. And look, this is also log 10, right? So if we look at the phi, compared to no contention, right? If we do scalar integration, we're running 10,000 times slower. And that's relatively independent of whether you do it for integers or for, uh, for other types. On Haswell, it's only about 100 times slower, which is still bad. On GPUs, the picture looks much better, and that's because we have very dedicated hardware for atomics. In particular, if you look at GPUs, uh, even if we do not have any work, right, up to like uh, 100 way contention, performance drop is pretty slight. Uh, if you're very eagle eyed, you will see that there's actually a slight performance increase. Uh, partly that is. <laughs> Uh, because you have, 
essentially you more of your stuff fits into cash and it turns out that these atomics are working directly in cash so there are actually situations where doing a vector add with atomics on gpus is faster than doing it without atomics even though there's no conflicts uh, basically because atomics work directly into cash and you have less cash in, in particular in, in l2 cash and that means that an atomic uh, update doesn't actually pull cash lines into l1 and so sometimes that's even faster but uh, you know that's more fluke uh, than something real so you shouldn't try using atomic as a uh, in non-conflicting situations as a performance improvement strategy but basically what we see here is, you know, there's somewhat low contention on the left, you know, and we have a relatively low penalty and then high penalty on the right. Now, if we add some work, and in this case, we do two power operations per atomic, right? This is in registers, it's not reading any new elements or whatever, right? It's just doing two power operations. Um, so, you know, kind of 20-ish instructions or something like that. But if you see that the, the low contention regime, right, looks now much better, right? There's much less performance penalty and it goes quite a bit further, right? On the GPU, you do not see almost any, any penalty all the way to thousand way contention. If we go to five power operations, right, that thing extends even further. On top of it, if you see where the, uh, where the uh, even at like scalar integration, right, when you look at the CPU, it, uh, it only drops by 10x, not by 100x as we had before. Right. So, in five power operations, you know, that's like, I don't know, 50 to 100 instructions or something like that, right? That is not terribly much. So if you actually do quite a bit of work for every atomic, you know, you shouldn't fear atomics. The main problem actually turns out for atomics on CPUs is uh, lost optimization. So when, when you see an atomic operation, and that's actually true even on the left side, right? It's actually gonna be slower on the no contention side than if you hadn't had put atomics in there. And the reason is that the compiler sees an atomic and it needs to uh, do certain things, you know, with like memory barriers. It doesn't, it doesn't allow it to, uh, you know, do certain movements of operations, you know, or reordering of operations and stuff like that. And so atomics can cost you, you know, even in the no contention regime a little bit. Uh, that's actually one of the reasons why if you compile only with serial, you know, the only execution space you enable in Cocos is serial, our atomics will actually compile out to not do atomic operations. One thing is our atomics work on arbitrary types. So we allow you to do that on, uh, you know, for example, atomic add on any type, which also has the plus operator. Uh, atomic exchange works on anything, you know, so whereas in particular atomic compare exchange. Uh, and that also includes types larger than the native atomic type on more architecture. So we can do more than 64 bit or 128 bit. Uh, what we do then is we go through an internal log table. It's a little bit slower than native atomics. Uh, but it's not terribly much slower than the compare and swap, uh, you know, implementation strategy you need to use for types which, you know, fit into a compare, uh, into an exchange atomic, but are not uh, natively supported, for example, for plus or other, you know, operations like min. Um, or oh, that's something maybe I should have added. We have all kinds of atomic operations, right? Like not just add, we also have like atomic min, atomic max, we have logical operations. We have bitwise operations, we have all kinds of operations. Just look it up in our API reference. Slide detour. Sometimes you actually want, you know, all access to a view be atomic, right? And it's kind of getting cumbersome to just write atomic add everywhere and stuff like that. Uh, so what we have is views actually have a fourth template parameter called memory traits. And one of the memory traits you can provide is the atomic memory trait. And if you do that, right, and you get an atomic view of an existing other view, right, you can just copy construct it from a view without that trait. If you add that memory trait atomic, what happens is that every access to the uh, to forces now will be atomics, right? If you write forces i comma j plus equal five, that will be an atomic operation. There are other memory traits, you know, which exist or experimental. For example, uh, there's an 
uh, compile time unmanaged, which actually reduces a little bit of overhead of unmanaged views, where it just removes an additional uh, conditional, essentially. Uh, Whereas restrict, which on some compilers will help you, and it's used for you know indicating that it's not aliasing any other allocation. Uh, and there's also things like a random access thing. So this random access thing is actually an interesting example. It's more an historical example nowadays, at least on NVIDIA GPUs. It's probably going to be more important again on on AMD GPUs. Um, but essentially, what GPUs have is we have a special pathway for reading read only random access, in particular random access with a lot of locality. Essentially that was designed for texture accesses, right? Where you, when you do like, uh, uh, you know, kind of filtering operations, you access like all the neighbors, right? But accessing all the neighbors is actually a pretty common thing you do in physics and engineering, right? Because most interactions are local. So in the early days of CUDA, or not quite early days of CUDA, you know, but, uh, you know, like a few years ago, what you had to do is you had to create these texture objects and essentially it was code like this. And I don't want you to really read that code. I just want to tell you that, you know, with Cocos views, you could just achieve that by telling it, I want to do random access and you get a const view, right? In that case, we would under the hood do all of this stuff for you and you get benefit of this texture fetches. Now, there isn't never uh, thing. Histograms are actually just an example of a more general pattern. And that's what we call scatter contribute. Essentially what a scatter contribute pattern is, it's kind of like a reduction, but you have many results. Potentially the result, the, un the number of results actually scales with the number of inputs, right? The more, in the, the bigger your problem is, the more results you also have. Uh, each result in a, a scatter contribute pattern only gets contributions from a small number of inputs and iteration or iterations. And usually you use that kind of pattern if you only have the input to results map, but not necessarily the inverse, right? You could Im imagine that you go to, you loop over all the results and then you loop over all the inputs to the results as an inner loop, right? And you can write an algorithm which doesn't have right conflicts. But sometimes you do not have that mapping. You only have the, you know, inputs to result mapping. And examples of that are, for example, particles contributing to neighbor forces, right? You go, you go to every particle, you find all its neighbors and you add forces to that. Uh, you know, cells contributing to forces on, uh, on nodes, computing histograms is an example of that, computing like a density grid from a point source contribution is an example of that. Uh, let's look at the first one, the particles, you know, contributing to your neighbors. And in particular, this happens when you have a, a, a kernel which uses Newton's third law, right? Actio, actio, gleich reactio. Um, what that says is that, you know, when you have like pairwise forces, when, you know, a force F goes on to or uh, is contributing to from that pairwise interaction to atom I, you have minus F on Adam J, right, on its neighbor. And so often what we do in these kind of calcul uh, particle calculations is we do not want to contribute, you know, Fij and Fji uh, explicitly. We just contribute, we, co we calculate one of them and then add it to both. And that's what you see here. We have this compute forces, we get positions, we get, uh, uh, you know, a force array where we want the results to go in. Uh, we have the neighbor list, you know, who are all my neighbors. And when you loop over all the particles, uh, you loop uh, inside for each particle, you loop over its neighbors. And then you compute, you know, the force by giving it the positions and you get some, you know, incremental force back and you add it to both particles. The problem with that is you have now race condition on F, right? Because uh, multiple, multiple iterations contribute to the same thing. So there are two useful algorithms here. You have the atomics we talked about, and that's thread scalable, but it depends a lot on atomic performance. You know, how good is your architecture? If you think back on the plots we saw there, uh, you know, GPUs were in a high contention scenario, you know, thousands of times faster than a KNL, for example. Another approach a lot of people used before they had to deal with GPUs was data replication, 
So that was actually a very common thing in molecular dynamics that you just created multiple force arrays, one for each thread, and then sum them uh, all up at the end. And that works really well if you have low thread count, right? Like smaller than 16. Uh, but it falls over if you have more. What we now have is we have a class called scatterview, and what that can do is it can transparently switch between the two. So it can give you either one depending on what architecture you compile for. How does that work? It essentially abstracts over the scatter algorithms. You have a compile time choice between you know, the different backends, and only a limited number of operations are supported. So you, know, you can do sums and stuff like that, and min and max, but not all the things. It's also part of Cocos containers. As of 3.2 uh, release, which is going to come hopefully next week, um, it's still experimental. We're trying to make non-experimental release after that. Uh, largely, we uh, have gathered feedback on you know, the API and we need to change a couple of smallish things. OK, so how do you create a scatter view? Uh, First, you, cr you, you wrap an existing view with a scatter view. What that allows us to do is that if we end up using atomics, we don't need an additional allocation. Right? You see that here. I create the scatter view, and I create it by wrapping the incoming force. Now, within the kernel, you need to get access, an accessor. That accessor behaves kind of like a view. And depending on what you compiled for, this, will, this FA now will either do atomic operations here, or it will be a thread local uh, version of a force array. Okay? In which case, it doesn't do atomics, but every thread sums up in its own thing. In this case, I didn't specify anything else. The only operations you can do on this guy is plus, min plus equal and minus equal. Times equal and stuff like that would not compile. There's one step missing, though. And that is we need to contribute back to the original view. We need to kind of combine all the results back. And what's, that's happening with the contribute function. So the contribute function writes it all back into the, uh, into the original view. This is a no-op when the scatter view uses atomic operations. And otherwise, it combines all these thread local arrays. Now, the problem with this approach, what we did here is that uh, if you compile for CPUs, it will allocate all these additional allocations up here in that line. And then it will deallocate them when it leaves the compute force function. And often you don't want that because it, it's actually pretty co costly to you know, allocate and destroy data. So what you often do is you actually store that thing permanently somewhere. If you do that, right, you actually need to be able to reset the, uh, all the values in the scatter view. In, in all the duplicates, right? And that's what the reset function does. Uh, it's called reset instead of set to zero because if you, for example, do min and max operations, you know, I'll show you, so I'll talk about it in a second. Uh, you know, it's not setting to zero. It needs to set to, you know, whatever max value or the min value is uh, so that uh, this reduction actually works. But the whole picture now is you get the scatter view from, you know, somewhere externally permanently stored. You call the reset function on this guy. You score, uh, you, do the, you get the access internally, you do the operations, and then you contribute back at the end. Sometimes you need something else than a sum. That works with ScatterView. ScatterView has a bit more options than uh, you know, what I showed you so far. Basically, it starts with kind of the same option as a view. You have a data type, a layout, and a space. Uh, but then comes operation, and we can, you can do like scatter sum, scatter prod as a product, min and max. And the last two guys are essentially Boolean variables, which tell you whether you want, or, or enums, which tell you whether you want uh, duplication or, or no duplication or atomics or no atomics. There's an exercise for that, which introduces this thing. Uh, it, the exercise actually has has already written three variants of the loop. One of them uses atomics, one of them uses duplicates, and uh, one of them uh, you have to introduce scatter view. And then when you run that and compile it on different architectures, it actually compa uh, it compares these different variants. On the CPU, it will compare all three variants, uh, you know, duplication or explicit duplication, uh, uh, scatter view, and atomics. On the GPU, it will only compare scatter view with atomics because duplication doesn't work since we would run out of memory. And what you should see when you do that is uh, that 
On the CPU, Scatterview gives you the same performance as, and better performance than Atomics, uh, but the same performance as duplication. On the GPU, uh, Scatterview gives you the same performance as the raw Atomics. With that, we come to the summary of this section. Uh, basically, what I try to teach you here is we talked about the atomics, we talked about how they are a thread scalable solution to thread safety, that locks and data replications are generally not portable or scalable. Uh, we talked about the uh, uh, atomic performance, you know, but it depends on how much work you do versus how much, uh, you know, how much, uh, how much conflict you have between different things uh, accessing the same value. We talked about the memory trait, which can allow you to access uh, a view everywhere atomically. Uh, atomics can be pretty low cost, you know, if you're uh, in the right situations. And uh, you can parallelize, you know, the scatter add pattern uh, with that, or generally scatter contribute pattern with that, uh, or the scatter view. Okay, do we have any questions on that? No, you can continue. So the last thing I want to talk today about is dual view. And we'll talk about, you know, why you may want to use that, what it is, you know, how it works, and there's also an exercise to do with it. So dual view is a class which was really designed originally to just help transition codes to Cocos. And Essentially, the problem uh, we ran into is that it was too complicated to figure out, you know, uh, everywhere, where do I need to, to move data and, um, and how to avoid, you know, unnecessary data transfers. In particular, we have a problem that when you start converting a big application, that you not generally have a completely holistic view of where data transfers are necessary. Right? You start modifying like small parts of the applications and maybe you modified, you know, the allocation mechanism to actually create Cocos views generally, but you might not actually figure out, uh, oh, did all these other pieces, you know, the, the, the other piece which was called before, you know, where somebody else is working on it, did that actually run on the GPU or on the CPU, you know? And so the, that's a problem with, with, which we had with the, just the general mirror pattern. Uh, you do not want to do deep copies if you don't need them. And it was really hard to figure out, you know, do I need a deep copy in a certain place? You know, where is the most recent data? Does the mirror have the most recent updated data or the device view? Uh, and then, you know, even if you figure that out, right, if then some other developer comes in and uh, modifies some function, you know, you didn't know about or whatnot, right? You modified the code. Uh, does that mean you have to, in your piece of the code, change where you copy, right? And uh, that is essentially the problem dual view helps with. What dual view does is it bundles two existing views. It bundles a host view and the device view into one data structure. And it has internally mechanisms which help you keeping track of where you modified things. It does not do automatic tracking of data freshness, okay? It doesn't do that because uh, the cost of that would be so high that it would probably not be usable for many use cases. Uh, so you must tell Cocos when data has been modified and you have to tell it where it has been modified, right? Which memory space. If you do that, then the dual view knows, you know, where the last modified version is and that means synchronization operations know whether they are necessary or not. So as I said, this guy bundles two views, the host view and the device view. You can get access to them via the view host and view device function. And what you then do is you modif mark them as modified via the modify host and modify device function. Essentially what that does is it just kind of increments the counter internally. When you need to synchronize, you call sync host or sync device, right? Sync to the host and sync to the device. And what that does is it checks the state of a modify flex to figure out whether or not it has to do a deep copy. You can also check the state of these flex, right? You can check whether you need to sync to the host or you need to sync to the device uh, via functions. Now it turns out that 
a lot of use cases we had <coughs> the, <coughs> the places where we needed to synchronize and modify were themselves actually templated on the device. So we were actually, uh, or execution space. So we were actually instantiated both for the host and the device. And that means we needed a generic way of doing that. And so all these functions, you know, getting a view, modifying, uh, marking something as modified, uh, syncing data and the need sync thing also have templated versions where you provide the space and it will, uh, you know, do the space specific version of that. Now, that probably is a little bit confusing. So what I have here is I have here an example, which kind of illustrates that hopefully a little bit better. If you look at the bottom here, right? So basically what I have here is I have a big class. And if I, at the bottom here, I have this do operations thing and somebody externally controls, you know, whether functionality A, B and C are gonna be run. Now, if you look at the code, right? It turns out that I already paralyzed functionality A and I paralyzed functionality B. But I didn't yet get to modifying uh, B. Okay, that's still running on the host. Now, depending on whether A, B, and C here are true, right? If say A and C are true, right? I, don't, I do not need an extra deep copy happening between running these two. But if I run B in the middle, I need to get my data back to the host because I'm gonna modify the data there. And uh, if I do that, I need to get it back to C again, when I, uh, uh, to the device again and C. Now, the nice thing about what dual view does here for you, if you look at what I'm doing here, I run A and I mark, I, I, I know I'm gonna execute on the device, so I call it sync device. I know I'm gonna modify it because I do this D data plus equal here, you know. Uh, so I'm telling it, I'm gonna modify the data. I mark it as modified. Uh, I'm getting the device view out, right? And then I'm accessing it. All of this only relied on local information. I know I'm gonna run on the GPU or on the device. I know I'm gonna modify the data and I know I'm gonna access that particular view. The same in B. I know I'm gonna run on the host, so I need to synchronize there. I know I want the host view, and I know I modify the data, so I call modify host. Okay. In C, I know I need to access the data, read the data on the device. I'm getting the device view. I also know that I'm not modifying it, so I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna uh, mark it as modified. Right? What it will do is that say you run in the first, in the first run through, right? You run A and C. So, you know, A modified the data. So this might synchronize or not, who knows? Uh, this synchronize will not do anything because I didn't get to B back in the middle. And it will also not mark anything, right? If I now come back, right? Uh, nothing and I'm, I'm running that again, right? I'm even the first one will not synchronize, right? Because it already synchronized back here. But say I run A, B, C, okay? Then this guy will synchronize to the device. If I, after that, run just B and C, nobody modified the data on the device in between, right? And I already had synced in the previous two operations to the host. So both host and device have now the, uh, the, uh, the most up-to-date data. And that means uh, when I'm coming back into B, it doesn't need to synchronize to the host, right? And it will not do that. Okay, I'll leave you alone with that example. Think about it. But the important point is I only need local information to get my data transfers correct. I do not need to know what the, the global data flow is. Dual view allows you to only with local information, get the correct deep copy behavior going. There's an exercise for that. Um, basically, it tries to exemplify that, uh, what we did up there. And what you should do here is you need to, uh, you know, change some code to actually use dual views and then call modify and sync uh, in the appropriate places. <clears throat> 
Any questions on that? No, you should, you should proceed. Okay. With that, we are at the end of today's module. We learned today about MD range policy, how it's something you can use for tightly nested loops. Uh, it's similar to the OpenMP collapse clause. You can do that for parallel fours and parallel reduces. It uses a tiling strategy for iterations uh, over the iteration space. And you can control the patterns, uh, you know, at compile time by setting them explicitly. We learned about subviews, how you take slices of views, uh, how it is kind of similar to what you can do in MATLAB and Fortran and Python. It, um, one important thing, you know, uh, use auto for the return type and absolutely make sure, uh, no, that was the next one. Uh, so basically use auto fair because it's really hard to figure out, you know, that, uh, what the return type is. Uh, you can, get indices there, you can get all the elements in the dimension, or you can use pairs, which uh, you give it a start and an end. We learned about unmanaged views, how unmanaged views in particular help you with interoperability with external memory. We learned about uh, you know, how it doesn't do reference counting, it doesn't manage the memory, so it's not gonna deallocate at destruction, and that's why it's called unmanaged. And in this case, really make sure that you get the proper dynamic and static extents, the proper memory space, the proper layout. If you get any one of these wrong, right, uh, all kinds of badness is happening. We learned about atomic operations. Uh, you can use them on the host and device via things like atomic add. Uh, we learned about the atomic trait for atomic accesses, that you can make all the access to a view atomic. And we learned about the scatter view data structure to uh, parallelize like scatter contribute patterns. And last but not least, we learned about dual views. We learned about you know, how it helps you manage your data synchronization between host and device. And in particular, how it helps in codes where you do not have a holistic view of your data flow, uh, which is a very common scenario if you, you know, port some code incrementally, some large code. So that is something where, you know, uh, dual view can help you manage your uh, data flow. Next week, we're going to talk about hierarchical parallelism. We're going to talk about uh, how to leverage more parallelism through nested loops, in particular through the concept of thread teams and vector length. In effect, we will teach you how to do the equivalent thing of uh, even things like warp uh, synchronous programming on GPUs. We're also going to introduce scratch spaces. So that's for getting temporary workspace in kernels. Uh, and it, lev it lets you leverage like GPU shared memory. Uh, last but not least, we will learn about unique token. And essentially, that will teach you how to acquire in a safe way per thread resources, right? You pre allocate some per thread resource, you know, or something which needs to be used uh, individually by each thread. And unique token allows you to figure out which one to get. Don't forget, you know, join our Slack channel. And if you want to drop into our office hours on Tuesday, we help with, you know, all the questions and also exercises if you want. Uh, find updates at the Cocos Lecture updates and the recording slides at the Cocos Lecture wiki. And with that, I'm done for today. And I hope to see you all next week again. Thank you so much for attending.